TV. Greetings, friends, fans, fellow believers around the world, including South Africa. This is Martin Zender, and before I get started back in 1 Corinthians, I gotta thank uh, Nate and David and Bill. Uh, Nate got me this new tripod. The tripod was falling apart. Yes, indeed. Well, look at this, honey. Look at this, honey, over here. What do you think of that? Wrap it around my steering wheel? And when I drive, see, that's a problem. But I don't drive while I talk. That would be kind of fun. But I'm kind of fun for you. So thank you, Nate. I appreciate that. You got that for me. He knew I had a problem. And boom, he came to the rescue. David Simone, um... He sent us two awesome lights, uh, Seth and me, two awesome video lights. One over here, one for over here. So I'm gonna be using those uh, sometime, so I thank you for that, David in Nevada. And then Bill, my friend Bill in Ohio sent me some vitamin C and some, uh, what was it? Uh, some kind of leaf, olive leaf, olive leaf, that's holy, olives were, Back there in the Bible days, they used olive oil to light the, the lamps in the temple. Olive oil. They used olive oil and a couple other things to anoint the priests and the prophets. So, thank you for that. There's one more thing. I can't remember what it is. Oh, yes, oregano oil. Didn't the, one of the wise men bring oregano oil to the baby Jesus? Is that? No? What was it? Coconut oil. Ah, all right, well, I was a little confused on that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, I got some big information for you today, and you're not going to get this anywhere else. I'm going to talk about the speed of our change when the Lord comes to snatch us away into the clouds to meet Him in the air. I'm going to talk about the speed of it, and I'm going to talk about the first thing we're going to do. No, let's put it this way. The last motion we will ever make on this earth I know what it is. I know the last thing we're going to do on this earth. Like a nanosecond before the snatching away. And I'm going to tell you what that is today. By the way, in case you don't know, this is Martin Zender. I am the world's most outspoken Bible scholar. I make sense for a living. And I do it here in Fort Lauderdale in my car, in my driveway. That's the alley back there. I used to broadcast from the alley when I used to live in the laundry room. Can you see the laundry? I'll show you the laundry room door back here. I can't see what I'm looking at, but there's the laundry room door right next to the red umbrella. That's the house where I used to live. That's the laundry room door. Made some good shows from there. I think they were good. A lot of other people told me they were, so I'll just have to trust people on that one. So this is where the one of the places where the truth is going forth. There are other places, of course, but it's my pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Now, 1 Corinthians 15. Yesterday I was telling you about how Paul revealed a secret. I know that by the word secret. And it is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Lo, a secret to you am I telling. We all indeed shall not be put to repose. This agrees with, with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. While saying, we the living who survive to the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is going to happen at a certain moment on a certain day. And when that happens in this eon, in our little world, in our life on this planet, some believers are going to be alive. I believe that we are that rare generation that will be alive. Paul prophesied of a people who would remain to the coming of the Lord. And here he says, we shall not all die. Can you believe that? The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians is talking about us. We're in the Bible. We're in the Bible. When Paul says we shall not all be put to repose, he obviously wasn't referring to himself because he was put to repose. And every other every other member of the body of Christ, every other believer unto this point has been put to repose. I firmly believe, and I've explained to you all the reasons why, that we are of that generation. We are those of this generation which shall not be put to repose. The believers in Jesus who will not die. We will not be acquainted with death. You know how few people can say that? We'll be able to say that? 
I think there will only be 500 or so people that ever lived that will be able to say that they didn't die. They'll be just try to imagine this because I think there's only 500 or so members of the body of Christ on the planet. There may be 5,000. I'll give you this, but that's generous, way too generous. I don't, I don't wonder where they are. I don't know. But can you imagine that? Let's say there's only 500 members of the body of Christ. Out of the billions and billions and billions who have ever lived, and we will be the only ones who will not know what it is to die. We haven't had that experience. We've had a lot of other trials. We had a lot of other problems. Not like we're going to be lacking problems. Not like we're going to stand at the dais of Christ and people are going to look at us and say, what was it like to not have problems? Well, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. But I will know what it's like to not to die. What did it feel like when you didn't die? Well, I don't know. It was kind of like being alive. Now, lo, a secret to you am I telling, we all indeed shall not be put to repose, yet we all shall be changed. That's the one thing in common of those who are remaining to this moment that happens. There's a moment, i got to emphasize that there's a moment where God is going to decide. I mean, God's already decided it. This is it. The moment has been destined beforehand, of course, and it will arrive. It will arrive, and it'll arrive in our world because some of us will be alive. And other some people have said to me, Martin, it doesn't really mean we're going to not repose. It just means like we're going to like die and live instantly, die and live instantly. I said, no, please read the text. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say we're going to die and live instantly. We will not die. We'll be changed. We'll be made incorruptible and immortal as we stand. Boom. It's going to be how fast? I'm going to tell you how fast right now. We all indeed shall not be put to repose, yet we all shall be changed in an instant, in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. I need to comment badly on that, but I'm going to keep reading. For he will be trumpeting, and the dead will be roused incorruptible, and we shall be changed. All right, this is loaded. I've never heard taught what I'm about to tell you. It's true, I taught it years ago. I first saw this, I think, in 1996, and I first taught it in Fairview, South Carolina. I, it might have been 95. I think it was 95. Then again, it could have been 97. Rick Farwell was the head of that group down there. Wait a minute. No, Rick Farwell was running this conference, but this happened in Melbourne, Florida. This was 1995. Melbourne, Florida, 1995. I unloaded this, and nobody could argue with it. Rick Farwell says, well, that's pretty good ex exegesis. And I said, what the hell is exegesis? What did I do? Should I apologize? Do I have to excuse myself? I guess exegesis is when you explain the scriptures. I don't know. Well, that's pretty good exegesis right there. And I said, well, I try. This is what I did. It wasn't hard. It was just standing out right in front of me and how nobody ever saw this before I don't know because we're so used to this in the twinkle of an eye even the King James says that doesn't it we should be changed in the twinkle of an eye I take great offense to that translation I'm going to sh show you why it will begin with the word instant we will be changed in an instant this is the Greek word atomos this in the, the English elements of atomos a is un it's the negative tamos is cut uncut Atomos, uncut. They say that the atom can't be cut. But in theory, uh, something that's uncut is the smallest possible thing you can have. We've, of course, eventually discovered that the atom can be split. There are different parts of the atom, so the atom can be cut. But to, in philosophy, it, this is pro might even be true. I don't know. Something so small that you can't cut it. You can't divide it because it's indivisible. Is that even possible? I don't know. Maybe it's an abstract theory but there it is that's the those are the english elements of the word atomos this describes the speed of our change we shall all be changed in the in an instant now this includes the dead and the living remember those who are who have died in christ including paul and all our fellow believers down through the two millennia since then who have died they are going to raise first and they are going to hear something that we are not going to hear. Are you intrigued? Stay with me. Both the dead and the living will be changed in an instant. Now, the dead will be roused first, 
but they're gonna like hover. They're not gonna be changed yet. But so, and the dead and the living, we're gonna be changed at the same time. And then we will rise together with the dead. This is, you, you, you couldn't make something like this up. And people can't believe this. They so much can't believe it that they try to twist this passage to make it teach something else. Or well, can't be saying that. Why? Same thing with First, first Thessalonians chapter 4. As I've told you, Paul never wrote plainer words than in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, except possibly for here. It's not that these words aren't understandable. It's that they're so fantastic, we can barely believe them. We can barely dare to believe that what he's talking about will actually happen. We'll be changed in an atomos. An instant. Instant is not a bad word. It's really not a bad word. It speaks of this speaks of the speed of our change. A snap of the finger is slow compared to this. And now this. Ladies and gentlemen, even in the concordant version, we all indeed shall not be put to repose, yet we shall be changed in an instant in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. In the twinkle of an eye. When I read the word twinkle, and even when I used to read it in the King James Version, I think it's that way in the NASB, my first Bible. So what the heck? I, I'm, I just accepted it for years. For decades and then I finally decided maybe I'll look this word up and so in the concordant version itself I go back to the concordant dictionary if you have this is the concordant literal New Testament mine's been around since 1986 it's a little wrecked as you can see but I love it it's my go-to Bible so I go back here to this is how you do it we're gonna give you a lesson on how to study the scriptures you go back here and you find the word twinkle Okay, let's see. We're going to find the word twinkle here. I found it ahead of time. And here it is. So what does it mean? According to the concordant dictionary in the back of the Bible, the the definition, this is Knox's definition, A.E. Knox. This is his, he's the one who compiled it, who translated this version. This is his definition. This is not inspired. His definition is the upward or downward motion of the eyelid. And this particular form of this word only appears once in the scriptures, and it is here. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. I'm going to turn a light on here. There we go. But this is just another form of the base word, which is ripto. But let me explain this, why this is untenable, why this cannot be. And I've read A. E. Nock comment on this in another place. He talks about the speed. It's as fast as the upward or downward motion of the eyelid. The eyelid. In other words, a wink. But he's talking about the eyelid. But isn't a twinkle a little light that shines on your eyeball? On your little iris in your pupil and besides Paul says in the twinkle of an eye this is we're talking about the eye here the eye not the eyelid so why does A.E. Knox say this twinkle is the upward or downward motion of the eyelid the thing's bad from start to finish the eyelid Paul doesn't say we'll be snatched away in the in a in, in, a, in an instant at the downward motion of an eyelid what in the twinkle of an eyelid he doesn't say that it's an eye it's an eye so why is a not putting eyelid and why twinkle does an eyelid twinkle watch look at my eyelid tell me if you see it twinkle okay i'll give you five seconds look hard you see a twinkle no the only time you see a twinkle you might see a twinkle in my eye if the lighting was right you might see a twinkle in my eye look at my eye could see a twinkle. Could see if the lighting was right. But here's my eyelids again. You see any twinkles? Report back to me if you see a twinkle. Is it possible for my eyelid to twinkle? No. So what the heck is twinkle doing in the sacred scriptures? It reminds me of Santa Claus. That there was a night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. 
and there's something about there, a twinkle of his eye, and a his bowl full of jelly, his belly did this, and he sends his reindeer flying, and there's a twinkle in there somewhere. It's, it belongs to a fairy tale. So I said, I'm going to look this word up. And I looked it up, and I found this Greek word, and A. Enoch's definition right here, his, his definition, his own Bible says, to toss, to toss. That's the root, English root element, toss, to toss, to throw. Well, that's nothing like a twinkle. So then I decided to look at other places in the scripture where a form of this word ripto occurred. And what do you know, uh, the word, or the word ripe. And then I looked in other places of scripture where the form of this word ripe occurred. And what do you know? I found the word ripto. And it means toss. Its English element is also toss. Just like ripe, the English element is toss. And the only place that form of this word, when I say form of the word, it's the same root word. You got ripe, ripto, it's kind of like walk, walked, walking. Right? I talked. I will talk. I am talking. Different forms of the same root word. That's what we're looking at here. So, ripto appears many times in scripture, and it also has the elements of toss. So, I'm thinking this really should be translated in the toss of an eye. It was also translated, uh, some places it was translated to pitch, even in the concordant version. They translated this one word, toss, I mean, ripto, they translated the toss and pitch. I don't like that. I'm reading a concordant version because I'm trusting that they're going to take one English word, one Greek word, and give it one English equivalent and not give it two English words. They're not going to take one Greek word and translate it two, three, four, five different ways. If we want that, we'll read the King James Version. So what is this here? I said to myself back in 1995. And um, so when I looked at the context, this is how you find out what a word means. You look at the context. Now, unfortunately, the word ripe in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it's the only place in Scripture that word appears. So we don't have the benefit of being able to look at other places in Scripture where that word appears and then to be able to interpret that word by the context in which it appears. That's the, that's the way you study. That's the way you find out what a word means. You get the word and then you look at all the different places it occurs, look at it in context, and there's one definition that should fit every context. One definition should fit every context. So here's the same form of the word, and it's the same English element toss. So I looked at the context. Check this out. It was used in Matthew 9.36, speaking of the throngs who were tossed as if sheep. They were tossed by every wind of teaching. They were screwed up by the Pharisees and they're like going hither and thither and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, they tossed the sick at Jesus' feet. Matthew 15, 30. They ripped out the sick at Jesus' feet. They just threw them in there. They just like put them in a slingshot. And there's Jesus over there. Remember at that one uh, place they lowered somebody through the roof? Okay, well this is another place they slingshot them. They tossed them at Jesus' feet. Ripped them. Judas tossed the silver pieces back at the priest. You remember that? They paid him 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ, and he tosses it back at them. So the, you're going to see that with every context, there's desperation inherent here. There's desperation. There's a critical desperation baked into this word. And the Jews toss their garments. This is Acts 22, 23. Paul is addressing uh, the Jews in Jerusalem, and he's talking about his conversion, and they're listening to him. But then he says, I was sent to the nations. And they, ah, oh, they, God, they just went crazy. They tossed their garments. Why people toss their garments when they're upset? I don't know why they do that. I would just do something like this. Or boo, but no, they have, they take their shirts off, their pants, their togas, whatever they're wearing, they throw it up in the air. But it's a desperate thing. It's like a spontaneous eruption. Okay, now I'm going to take this back to 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and you're going to see something you've never seen before. 
Okay, and then they toss over the ship's gear in Acts 27, 19. This is when Paul is going to Rome and their ship runs into a hurricane or the hurricane might have run into the ship. I'm not sure which how it happened. I don't think the ship would have pur purposely run into the hurricane, so it was the hurricane's fault, but they, they wanted to lighten the load in order to make land, so they toss, they desperately toss things out of the ship in order to lighten the load. Now, it was translated pitch. The demons pitched a man in Luke 4, 435. They, they pitched a man. I don't know how they did it, but this man was like going crazy. He was being pitched to and fro. I don't know why you don't translate a toss there as well. Uh, Jesus told people, it's an advantage to you to be pitched into the sea rather than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Talking to the Pharisees, pitched. Why not toss? They pitched the anchors out of the ship during that same hurricane, pitched it. So there's all the places in scripture where this word ripto occurs, which is also related to ripe, which is the word used in 1552. Now, how does A.E. not get twinkle out of all this? What I get is toss. It's a desperate tossing. It's something like Judas throws the coins down. Um, the people throw theirs sick loved ones at Jesus' feet. They're desperate for change. Uh, the, the Jews throw their garments in the air. You see, it, it's spontaneous. It's it's uh, a little loose. It's a little fraught with emotion. That's what the freaking word means. And now we go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Lo, a secret to you I am telling, we all indeed shall not be put to repose, yet we all shall be changed in an instant in the twinkle of an eye. A Enoch is wanting to make twinkle of the eye to speak of the speed. And he describes it as, it's so fast that it's the speed it takes for an eyelid to go down. Whoa, look at that, isn't that fast? We're gonna be changed this quickly. But this has been preceded by we'll be changed in an instant. That is uncut, the fastest possible period of time. So the speed is covered in this word instant. Atomos, the speed is covered there. We got it. It's the smallest possible period of time. Uncuttable time. So why would Paul then be qualifying superlative speed with lesser speed? We will be changed in the uncuttable moment of time and like as fast as it takes your eyelid to go down what it can't be that's like saying he's the absolute best football player on the team and he's good yeah and he's good what so I invite you now to take the proper definition of this word toss and to put it in the context just do it just do it that's what you're supposed to do in translating just put it over there and see what happens we shall not all be put to repose yet we all shall be changed in an instant in the tossing of an eye at the last trump for he will be trumpeting and the dead will be roused incorruptible and we shall be changed there are two groups of people being changed at this time the dead and the living the dead and the living are going to be changed. That's the, we have two groups. The one thing in common is they're all gonna be changed in an instant, but the dead will raise first. We found that out in first Thessalonians chapter four. But watch what happens here when Paul talks about the dead. For he will be trumpeting and the dead will be roused incorruptible. He doesn't say the living, but he will be trumpeting and the dead will be roused. And we know the dead are roused first. So the trumpet is a sound, and the trumpet wakes the dead. So the trump we will not hear the trumpet. We will not hear a trumpet. The trumpet is for the dead. They're raised by sound. What are we? They're raised and changed by sound. What are we changed by? Sight. Sight is faster than sound. For the living, we are changed by the tossing of an eye toward Christ. Here's a transadministrational truth for you. John says, I think it's 1 John, uh, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we see Christ, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. We will be changed at the tossing of an eye, a desperate longing to see him. We will sense 
in the last moments before our departure from this earth, in the last moments before we are miraculously changed from mortal to immortal and from corruptible to incorruptible, we will sense that he is there. There he is. Christ is descending from the heavens. And we will desperately, longing for change, just like all the people where this word was used before, longing for change, desperately doing something, try to make something happen. The, the people throwing their loved ones to Christ. Why? They want change. They want them to be well. The, the, the mariners throwing their load off the ship. Why? Because they want to bring a change about, don't they? they? They want to arrest the destruction of the ship. Judas throwing the money, tossing it, ripto, the money at the feet of the Pharisees. Why? He regrets. He has a change of heart, a change of mind. Every time this word is used, it speaks of a change. That's the context I read to you. Every one of them, a change. There's a brink of change. So that's what's happening here. We're at the brink of change. And we, the living, will not hear the trumpet. The trumpet is not for us. Everybody thinks that we're waiting to hear the trumpet. I'm not waiting to hear the trumpet because I know what this verse means. He will be, this is what it says. Why have we missed this? For he will be trumpeting and the dead will be roused. The trumpet is for the dead. The trumpet is for the dead. They hear the sound and they awaken at the sound of the trumpet. For the living, we have something that's far faster than sound and it's light. And the light will bring the image of Christ as he's descending from heaven to us. And we will, I'm convinced that we will have a premonition moments before this happens. And we will start to quiver and vibrate and get just <clears throat> overwhelmed by knowing what's about to happen. And then we will sense, we will know that the Lord is descending. And then in desperate need of change, in desperate desire to change everything we've been experiencing, we're going to toss our eyes desperately toward Him, toward Christ. And we will be changed by the tossing of an eye. The dead are changed by the trumpet. The trumpet will sound. The dead will be roused. We are changed in the tossing of an eye at the last trump. And when we see him, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is.